I have lost my battery. Maybe a chip would be running me as a machine. Look, there are experiments on reversing human age. Genome project is about to get over. The scientists have found out methods with which from any age a person can be turned back to 25 years. So, this is how this pervasive technology is defining the way we live. This technological intervention in everything you do. Is your life organic? The very organic, organicity of life is completely lost. So this is the technoculture. You know, I'm introducing you to this technoculture by this image of a humanoid, which is going to be a way of life very soon. And why I am making this statement is because now, over the period of time, we are realizing that natural conception and natural delivery are a serious problem. You know, out of 10 babies born, 9 are test tube babies. We are gradually moving towards that biomechanized era where maybe children would be prepared on the table. There would be an artificial home and parents would be observing the growth the way you observe the growth of a plant and you are so. Well, I'm not here to discuss these issues, but I want you to understand that when you say technoculture, you mean these facts. And there's no getting away. I then want you to read the statement along with me by Harari. In a world diluted by irrelevant information, clarity is power. You know, there are anticipations that we are all got going to die of data. There's this idea of big data if you have studied it carefully. Well, we'll del del deliberate on that for a moment and then I will quickly go to what I want to say. You know what? What is the size of the Google server? I mean, I'm storing my presentation in this device. It probably will have a hard disk of 500 GB or maybe 1 TB. Google, which stores all your data, all your data, all my data. What must be the approximate server size of Google? When I read five years back, it was about six to seven football grounds. Hello? <laughs> as big as this campus provided. So what you're doing effortlessly has a cost. Now Google was struggling to keep that entire facility cool. What it did is it took all its servers to Antarctica. Now heat generated by that server is melting those glaciers there. Terrorism is not going to kill us. There has been terrorism. Yeah, there was Ravan. There were Dalits and there have always been a fight between good and bad. But this data, you know, when you send one image, it can go to millions of folks. You know, this the culture of buying. And imagine the kind of, you know, data transaction that is happening. <coughs> we are moving towards 5G. You know, every G is adding a danger to your own plan. <coughs> Denmark successfully, a small country, experimented with 47 gigabyte download speed. They downloaded 64,000 movies in one or two seconds. I'm just forgetting. Imagine what is going to happen. I think teleportation is going to be a reality that you will be teleported. For example, I want to come from Surat to this place. I stand in a device, I am uploaded, and then I'm downloaded right here. <laughs> But that, that would be a problem. Within that download, I may have someone else's link, you know, data corruption. <laughs> 
<laughs> or I wake up with a head of a dog barking here. Who is going to give this keynote address? <laughs> so this is the kind of technology that we have created around us. It is not bless us, it is going to kill us. If we don't retract, or if it doesn't kill all of us, 50% of the population is going to go off. Because you can't sustain the kind of activity that is going on is, is already saturated. I don't know why we still sustain. Well, yet sustainability, 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 ah, this is turning out great just crystal for me, is not our discussion at the moment. Let's move on. Technology has been shaping our cultures. You know, this is two cavemen trying to light the fire. Fire came, language came, we came. I don't want to go, go into when did they came. Come millions of years back. Languages thousands of years back. But then every one of these probably changed the way we live. And these technologies, every time they are introduced, look at the way mobiles change the way we Does anyone have Nokia 3011? Is, 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 is anyone using that phone right now? No. In fact, I want to discuss the issue of privacy. You know? I was a part of a debate is technology a boon or a bane? And then we discuss there is zero privacy. If some of you are not aware there, somebody, if your internet is on right now, somebody is listening into what you are listening right now. Your life is an open book. All your messages are read. All your images are scanned. All the phone calls that you are making, someone is taking note of that and is selling it to the to, to those who are to, those who are busy marketing. Let's go to the next. So technology has been shape, shaping our culture. And as Sir rightly said, the culture has been shaping our literary world. So that is that domino effect. If there's something changing here in the culture, you know, it's like culture is the software and we are the hardware. Because I, I'm talking this technology language. You know, you are operated by the operating system called culture. And that operating system is now defined by the technology that, that surrounds us. That is primarily what I am trying to establish here. Before I go to tell you what it does to literature, let's understand what it is doing to us right now. The evolution of languages, because then literature has to deal with language. Even your culture gets expression through the language. I would summarize this entire evolution of language in four <coughs> phases. The first one is physiocentric phase of communication, where we use our body, gestures to convey basic emotions, like anger, happiness, threat, Danger. Then we evolved. You know, these monkeys that we are, Homo sapiens sapiens, this sapiens got a frontal long mutation, and there are all kinds of theories of how language developed. I don't want to go into it because that's not my concern at the moment. But then we started organizing sounds for communication. These oral languages start evolving. Now that was a phase which we got termed as photocentric discourses. And then we come to cryptocentric. Thanks to Gutenberg ji and Kextin ji, they gave us writing, printing press. Rather than writing, I will correct myself, printing. And what we are missing out here is, we are at a brim of the end of the, you know, written culture as, as, as it exists. Or printing culture. 
because I mean, we are the last generation of people who are carrying pens and papers, these books, 10 years from now, you won't see them. I was sharing with sir that my son studies in a school which bought 7,000 iPads. That was the biggest order in the history of Apple. This school bought iPads because they decided that children would use minimum pen and paper and printed books. They use these devices in their classroom. So it is mandatory for the teachers and students to use iPad while learning and teaching. And we are not far from this culture. Maybe you know next time when I come after five years, each one of you would be sitting with your iPad or tablet or some device. Absolutely. And you know, with 100% assurance, it's not parallel. So then, what did printing do? Printing, you know, destroyed the oral culture. That was the benchmark. I think I'm beginning from there. Then I'll come to the end of the print era because we're witnessing that right now. We are the part of that transition. And a lot of us are very nostalgic about uh, you know, books being more tactile, you hold it in the hand and you experience it. As against that, you have a Kindle, a dead uh, electronic device. Uh, I mean, we're still struggling with the transition. And a lot of my senior <coughs> colleagues would agree that reading a book is more fascinating than reading a pen. Will you agree with me? <coughs> that it, it's a completely different experience. You know, it's a completely different experience to have the fragrance of those, <laughs> those inky pages. Along with those academic concerns, there are those romantic concerns. Where did you squeeze flowers in there are no books? <coughs> no. And those flowers then happen. In Kindle you can't squeeze them as long as you don't put a cover at the back, a flower in between and push it through. So then, crypto-centric, where we started printing, we started using symbols. Then, we come to an era, and I want to stay here and discuss a few facts. We are presently in this era. I quickly took a, a million years journey, and we are here. We are now at a new crypto digicentric or technocentric discourses. What do I mean when I say digi centric or new crypto centric? You know, languages, since I'm a man of applied linguistics primarily, languages are like living organisms. They need an ecosystem to survive. And without that ecosystem, these languages what? A lot of these languages have already died. Hebrew, for example. Some of these languages are on a deathbed, Sanskrit, Latin. And I said, language is a living organism. Some of these new languages are taking birth. And some of you have been the birth givers to this new language. Can you tell me what language I'm talking about right now? What's language? Language of social media. Now when we say this, we are talking about a whole new language that is evolving. We, we all know it, but let's quickly visit it. What have, how, what have we done in the new crypto century? What did you say? <coughs> we started squeezing expressions. We started using alphanumeric. You know how do you write 9 on a message? N and 8. So much so that we have started just using one letter spellings. Where are you? W are you? No question mark. Isn't it a new language? 
And why did it happen? Can quickly some 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 can someone quickly tell me? Why did we, as many purists believe, kill the organicity of the language by experimenting with it in, in a way that if if someone reads it, it doesn't look like a language at all. And what would happen if you allow students to write papers in a social media language? They will complete your paper in 30 minutes and say, written, take care of it. <laughs> and a lot of us as English teachers, we have many right now, isn't it? We stare at it. We say that in standard prose, end sign is not allowed. We chop it off. Ruthless. But then, can you stop this evolution from happening? Let me dwell on why did it happen. It's an interesting discussion. Why did we do this? Why did we kill the language? I'm sorry? Time save for me. Time save for me. That is a usual perception, but that's wrong. Some people would say because the human beings are very lazy. Who writes the complete spelling? But I have an option which is half the size. I would wait for one more response. But it's a valid response. It's one of the reasons. For easy communication. For easy, how, how do you define your easy, sir? Technology has made us to do that. No. Because uh, in SMS, when uh, mobile were introduced that time, there was a limit. You can just add. We'll come into that. Right? Economics. This is the money. When short man's system was introduced, about seven, eight years back, I read a headline of a newspaper article. Which said SMS is SOS for English language. It's a distress message, save our souls. And I'll agree with it. What happened? I'll quickly tell you the story. When short message system was invented, we were given 140 characters per message. Even space was a character. Each message was initially costing you 2 rupees, then 1 rupee, now you have different packages. Now in those days, when I wanted to write a lavish message, it was costing me 10 rupees. Because it was going across you know, these narratives. But they cost me. So I started chopping down these narratives from wherever I can. This is the basis why this new DG-centric discourse, the DG-centric Language is evolved. So if I've written friend, I'll chop down all the vowels. F R N D. Abbreviations, experiments. You know, now if you check in with a youngster, you have to keep asking him, hey, what is this abbreviation? What is this abbreviation? <laughs> so, and then a new revolution took these DG-centric into what I have invented as emoji-centric languages. You know, these telecommunication had one serious problem. It didn't have non-verbal support. So when I say something over a phone or when I text someone, I didn't understand what I was feeling. So what WhatsApp opened the floodgates of integrating non-verbal and verbal on a, a, a digital platform. And that was a revolution. Because there is no way before this technological intervention that on a written page, on a, I hope you understand, a written script was not in a position to give you the non verbal side of that communication. It had to be interpersonal. 
Much before WhatsApp started giving you emoticons, you know, Gmail had introduced them. Some inorganized expressions of smile, anger, laughter, if some of you remember that. So, as I said, you know, language is a living organism, and this is how we have evolved from physiocentric, just using body to communicate, to sounds, to written symbols, to now digital space, and now emoticons. The language is dying. You know, I'll tell you an interesting incident, which is very relevant here. Between the two censuses, census of 1961 or 60, I'm not sure, I'm just confused over here, but 60 or 61. In the census of 1960, I'm calling it 60 for the 61 directly. About 1658 languages were identified in India. You can go to People's Linguistic Survey by Ganesh Devi. Ganesh Devi is our own linguist at this university. So please visit this. It is on uh, Wikipedia. People's Linguistic Survey. This fact is mentioned there. I'm telling about how languages were massacred. 1500 languages were massacred. Bhasha ki sabu hatya. In the next census, after 10 years, you know, our policy makers applied a filter that we will recognize. Of these 1658 languages, some of them were spoken by tribal communities, like we have in South Africa, about 3 4,000 people, just spoken languages, won't have any script, won't have any grammar, just oral varieties. They said, we will recognize languages which has a minimum of 10,000 speakers. In the next survey, in 70s or 71, they ended up listing 158 languages with that filter of 10,000 speakers. 1,500 languages were relegated in oblivion. And with those, when a language dies, the knowledge encoded within that language dies. And since these were tribal languages, a lot of Ayurvedic knowledge, valuable knowledge which was encoded in this language, disappeared forever. Isn't it something shocking? 1500 languages gone. Next please. So, they would, you know, to understand sometimes this podium, I want people to see this podium clearly from here. I'll have to go back and see what it is. So, I'm taking you back to the Middle Ages and then I'll take you back here and then we will move on. These are some facts, we'll read it together. They don't require discussion and many of these facts are not a breaking news for you. You know it already, but I want you to think about it. All right. Many scripts were read, you know, they were all handwritten, papyrus and other scrolls, this painful act of sharpening that pen and dipping it in that pot and writing, maybe for writing one word you need to dip it for ten times. Therefore they were read. When news arrived, they were shouted. You know, they, they did not have these, this is pre-printing era that I'm talking about. So they didn't have a newspaper to read. So the drummer would come. Suno, suno, suno. We would have seen that in some movies. And then the news is shouted. Alright? Only in the 15th century, courier service in local mail started in southern Germany. The news of the fall of Constantinople, you know, take note of this, took 30 days to reach Venice and 3 months to reach the rest of the Europe. They did not have WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, it is estimated that if it is a serious news, it takes three minutes to reach the entire population of the world today.
and you see the videos. Now the written script, you have videos. If there's a plane crash, you see that plane crash on, on your screen. Look at how fast we are right now and how slow we were on Friday. Mamri was gold. The oral traditions, there were memory theatres. So I will demonstrate my ability to memorize the entire Ramayana, Mahabharata, all Vedas. And what has technology done to us today? I remember, as I was in 10th standard, I used to remember the phone numbers of all my relatives. And my dad would call me and say, Ke bhai bhai phone number number one. And I'm da 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 Now we don't even sometimes remember the second SIM card's number that we have. <laughs> so, this is how we have changed. Next. Access to reading and writing was a matter of mind and wealth. Rich people had a reader and a writer in their household. The solution came from the southern Germany. From a goldsmith named Gutenberg, according to James Brooke, Gutenberg and his printing press destroyed the oral society. I wanted to take note of this. Because your cell phones and internet is going to destroy the printing technology. And then we will discuss when this printing is destroyed, what is going to be your literature? I'm taking you there, gradually. <coughs> this was the most radical alteration ever made in the Western intellectual history. And we know the, the results. Immediately you had, I mean, printing was one of the major reasons why Renaissance could give you the fruits of very enriched literature, you know. Look at the literary output in that, that particular era. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Ben Johnson, Spencer. No other age is as fruitful in literature as that, as far as I understand. Next. Now, quickly we are taking a time tour of what were the technological benchmarks and how the society was then complete. I have just chosen a few to media. We could have discussed a few, few hundred uh, such facts. 4000 BC, agriculture and writing originates in Sumer. Before the 15th century, the messages are transmitted. You know, human horseback or humans would go, pigeons were used. Printing press, I just discussed it. Industrial revolution begins with steam engine, and steam engine becomes the reason of industrial transportation revolution. Diesel engines come, I mean, you know the story. Steam power, printing press, telegraph comes in 1837. The beginning of what electronic revolution that we are seeing right now was around this time. Telegram, radio, Morse code, television, all of that. Next. Gramophones come. 1887, 1888, 90s that we've got. Movies. <coughs> 1927, radio becomes a mass medium. And all of these were the game changers. In their own capacity. Then comes TV, 1939, and we come to what we are right now. The computers come between, I mean, you know, it evolved from 40 to 70. Computer experiments of that began much earlier, but what we know as a modern computer, you can see, you know, developed into what it is right now within this span of time. And then the death nail was internet. The integration of computer and internet created a revolution 
which nobody even thought of in their wildest nightmares. I'm not using the word dream for a reason. You know, it was believed that the creation of knowledge between 16th century, the knowledge that we had in 16th century took about 100 years to double itself. You know, then 50, then 25, then 5, that's how, you know, our ability to transcend data went on. You know, from those 30 days constant in a ball news to now we have come with every click of the mouse you are doubling the human knowledge. And I told you, storing that knowledge is going to have a detrimental effect on the very life of this planet. Ki aap itna zada data generate kar rahe ho roj, generation ka madlab yaha hai duplication. Koi nahi baat nahi ho rahi. See, ek Aishwarya Rai ki image ke million copies would be saved in different devices. And then they are served, saved in a particular server. Imagine that. Let's move on. Now before we understand what is this internet going to do, let's understand what television did. And because one of our themes is culture, I want to understand how technology shapes our culture. And then that culture then influences literature later. Right? Uh, Marshall Mackler, he was considered as the media group, the first ever media group, and he, next please, next. He was interested in analyzing contemporary examples of persuasion in popular culture. Every advertisement is a psychological conspiracy. जो बीवी से करे प्यार, वो प्रेस्टीज से कैसे करे काम? Just to prove that he loves his wife, he had to run to that store and get that hell of a prestige on the table. These are these are the the, the methods of persuasion. He said, medium is the message. This was a. a, a a mantra into, into media studies. By the time, by this he meant, societies have always been shaped more by the nature of media by which people communicate than by the content of communication. And look at how television was introduced as a systematic campaign by Americans. I don't have an Indian example, I'm sorry, but I have an American example. Next, please. Next, please. See this ad carefully and read. There's the greatest happiness in television, a great happiness in home, where the family is held together by this new common bond television. What is a common bond in American society then? A hearth, a fireplace, where people would sit, chat, you know. Now that hearth, that fireplace was replaced by television. Now this is how persuasive technology is, friends. This is how it impacts your psyche. And we know the television story. What it has done, you know, this idiot box. And all of us sitting here have given huge chunks of our time to television. Next. This is more interesting. Can you see this and tell me what, what, what is the message that they would use here? Or they want you to read anything. What is the message here? Unfortunately, I don't have a timing device here, otherwise I don't have. 
Yeah. There's an empty stadium. Empty stadium? No, sir. I mean, it's because of the visual problem. <coughs> it is, in fact, a full stadium. <laughs> Somebody is playing baseball here, <laughs> and there's a chair here. Chair right in front of television. The message is, when you have a television, you don't need to go to the stadium. You see a better visual of the live match sitting in your room. And many of us would agree. Yes. I have been to matches and I've seen those small dolls moving around. <laughs> and you don't recognize a player because the face is not visible by the body language you recognize. <laughs> sometimes by height, sometimes by the bulk. But you must certainly, I mean, you cannot recognize that person by the face. So, they are so many powerful capsules. Hai. I have chosen some advertisements of television. Next. The child's mind is shaped. He wants to be what he sees on the screen. Next. The romance was shaped by television. Largely. And we know it. It is still going on. Next. The concept of home theatre. So then, television became a uniting force. Was persuaded to be a uniting force, which was not. And medium is the message, is a theorem that I proved here with these entities. Let's go to the next. Now we are coming to this technoculture. I talked about the marriage between computer and internet. <laughs> and this marriage has been the deadliest of all marriages on this planet, believe me. <laughs> there is no such marriage and there will never ever be such marriage. Because this is going to be the end of it all. This is the last union which is going to produce results which, which probably will die on this planet, believe me. Next. Internet and technology culture, what it is, just try and look the final aspects of it. Inclusive, online, all in one technology. What has happened is, all of the technological aspects have been synchronized into one 5 inch device in your head. You do everything online today, gaming, shopping, you pay your bills. How many of you go to the DSL office to pay your bills now? Communication, entertainment, this is also the end of television. In five years, all televisions are gone. Television, radio, I remember a television era. You know, where only two Darshan used to broadcast programs, Chitralekha on Fridays. And three people were needed to successfully see few minutes of that broadcast or program. So we were three brothers, I'm being on a pilot wheel, I'm sorry. So the eldest one has the luxury of remaining close to the television. He uses his own heart. He is tuning. The middle one is on the window. And the youngest one is on the antenna. So from here, if the image comes, this man says, I I don't know whether you follow in Gujarati. I hope that the message would be broadcast here and that would be very important. <laughs> And you realize that you have got a you, well, then you have to start telling again. <laughs> so what you see now is a high definition internet streamed 
you know, real life images on on a file. You have analog displays. I got this new mobile. The the high definition almost gives you a 3D sort of an uh, image on your screen. For more than a year now, I have not sat in front of a television to watch a match or a news. I'm talking about just my own self. My TV is lying unaddressed. My wife watches her programs on her phone. My son has his own phone. I so television. That unifying force which we're persuaded to is is going. And what is replacing it? What you have in your hand is not a mobile phone. I'm sorry to say that it is a computer. And we never realized this transition that a cell phone became a computer in our hand. Hello? It just happened. Connectivity and communication. What makes us uneasy is we want to remain connected. You know, there's this craving. If you're sitting alone and in front of your phone, just try to observe. How many minutes you can keep away from that? Think of a situation where you are alone in a room. There's a television. I mean, there's a phone in front of you. Every two minutes, it is turning out to be a disorder now. Merger, I said, but everything has all forms of entertainment. And why viewership on internet-based entertainment is increasing? Doesn't even know this. It is not simply the facility, the 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 what the use of friendliness of the mobile. If I begin carrying, I'm going to discuss it in detail, bro. But what is making viewership increase on online entertainment platforms is there is no censorship whatsoever. There is no way satellite games can be allowed by broadcasting ministry. It cannot be broadcast on Indian television. There is an increasing traffic there because their things are more vulgar, violent than the permitted social standards. Again, a considerable fact. Why Netflix is more popular? Because everything that doesn't get censored, you know, through our censor boards, would go freely on it. <coughs> In our business, many of us I am going to tell you an irony. I was at a Delhi airport <coughs> attending a new pub event that we were talking about. Somehow my internet was not working. I went to an Ola taxi and I said I will go to this address. He said, sir, online book <coughs> I said, I have money. He said, I can't take you, sir. <laughs> Look at the irony of the situation. I, the human connection was not enough. Money was not enough. I had to go, you know, buy a satellite to that gentleman who is standing right in front of This is what technology is doing to us. And I stood flabbergasted and said, what the hell, what do I do now? <laughs> Anyways, the idea is that this technoculture is something so pervasive that we don't even realize the magnitude of it. And none of us for sure know how it is shaping who we are, how it is shaping our identity. Uh, if I put it in a better word, how it is changing our identity. In a very subtle way, you are changing every day without a conscious.
conscious notice in your conscious mind you're being programmed. And that is what this technoculture is. Virtual reality. And these virtual platforms have made these kids mad. Especially these gaming. You know, you've had that some sort of a, I have never seen what is virtual reality. We have read a lot about it. And what you see inside appears more real than the real. It's, it's a sort of a circle you can of experience. You know, you have finding, finding <coughs> theaters. So if there's an earthquake, you, your chair shakes. If there's a rain, there's a spray of water on your face. Algorithms. And well, like a little bit for this. Now, what if you're using Google? Google has become a verb now, isn't it? Google it. From now, it became verb because of its usage. Why don't you see advertisement on Google? I said it has servers as big as this campus. Imagine the investment. Imagine the working cost. You can see one more time Google is Do you think Google is an NGO providing this information to the activity free of charge? What is the revenue model? Have you ever wondered? It sells data. It sells data. Where it is? To whom? How? Why? Fortunately or unfortunately, I was in corporate. I was an academic director of a company which provides skill solutions. So we were establishing language labs. And then we had to do a lot of policy intervention, meet people, and say like, teach skills to your students. A lot of principals are interacted with. Director of Kendri Vidyalayas, Namodhi Vidyalayas. We were trying to see that there is some interaction. But unfortunately, there is a lot of resistance to anything new on. Uh, I, mean, I don't want to discuss that, but I have these experiences. You know, your phone number and name, that simple data, Parish Joshi and number, is sold at a cost of 50 paise to 1 rupees, depending on who you are selling. And if you are not aware, your entire profile, your waist size, to what clothes you wear, to what oils you use, to what your entire behavior is under a systematic scrutiny. All your messages are read, all your calls are heard, all your images are viewed. Google earns by selling your privacy. Sounds unethical, isn't it? Gusta bhi aata hai Google pe saale kabhi ho, aap hamara data bhi chhod dete hain. But fir wo gusta shant ho jayega, kyunki uske bina chhod dete hain. Hello. Decide karo, pratigya le lo ki kal se main Google nahi use karunga. You have to throw your phone because it runs on Android platform. You know, every time you download a free app, the first permission that it asks is for contents. I will explain what is algorithm. You know, today when you go home, go to Google, search for Titan Watch <coughs> or any watch. Remember the name of the company. Then go to any online portal, see one or two models of this wristwatches or sunglasses or anything that you want to buy. And then go to any website which gives you free data, these Titan watches would be dancing around on the screen with you. Us website ko kaise pata chala ki aapne Titan khareedne ki ichha aapke andar jaagi hui hai. Algorithm is, you know, it's like, for example, 
एक लिपस्टिक कंपनी है माय फ्रेंड्स अ मार्केटिंग मैनेजर विद अ बिग मार्क जाइंट आई नॉट यू टू डिस्क्लोज हिज नेम टू हेल्प अ कंपनी लास्ट टाइम व्हेन वी मेट ही सेड लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल अ लिपस्टिक कंपनी इफ आई सेंड एन अल्गोरिथम एंड आई पुट लिपस्टिक इन द सर्च इंजन इस जो टारगेट एरिया है उस एरिया में जितने लोगों ने लिपस्टिक बोला होगा उन लोगों का फोन नंबर सीधा मेरे सामने 